Ahoy! It's your old buddy Hambone here back again with a brand new coupon code from our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This month, the promo code is RPG, and it's good for $5 off orders of $25 or more, either online or in person. That's right, the code is RPG, and it's running from September 14th through October the 5th. Never been a better time than now to pick up some fun new games, or maybe an old game that you had your eye on for a while, for yourself and for your friends and families. So why not go over to noblenight.com, pop in the promo code RPG, and get $5 off an order of $25 or more from September 14th to October the 5th. RPG is the code from our friends over at Noble Knight Games. This is the Vintage RPG Podcast, your source for the best in classic and contemporary RPGs. With your hosts, Hambone and Stu. Welcome to the Vintage RPG Podcast, coming at you again from the clubhouse, hidden somewhere in the swamps of New Jersey. I'm John Hambone McGuire, and with me, as always, is the editor-in-chief of Unwinnable.com. The last time he put out a trap, the only mouse he caught was not the gray mouser, Stu Horvath. <laughs> I think the last trap I was involved in was a box of RPG books, and it was for me. You know, back in the day, they'd say if you ever wanted to catch a hand bone, you just put up a box with a stick and a string and throw in a taco, a can of Paps Blue Ribbon, and a copy <laughs> of Heavy Metal Magazine, and that's all it would have taken. However, nowadays, if you would change that up and put in a beautiful Stewart's Key Lime Soda, a copy of Heavy Metal, and a deep fried hot dog, <laughs> you might have yourself a hand bone. Stu, how are you doing today? Pretty good. How are you? I am pretty fantastic, man. I'm actually very excited to talk about Lankmar. It's something that I've always heard about and never actually gotten to experience myself. So why don't you tell our listeners a little more about Lankmar? All right. So Lankmar is a city created by Fritz Lieber and his friend Harry Otto Fisher back in the 30s. And it's a sword and sorcery setting. The two most famous characters are Fafford and the Grey Mouser. Fafford is a big barbarian with a big beard and long hair, and Mouser is a little guy. He's a little bit more of a city slicker. He was a mage's apprentice, and they are both through fate and inclination. They have taken to lives of thievery in the big old sinful city. Fafford is sort of a self-insert for Fritz Lieber, who wrote the bulk of the stories, and Grey Mouser is a self-insert of Fisher, who only wrote a couple stories. And Fritz, even though he wrote the vast majority of the stories, it is largely credited when people think of Fafford and the Grey Mouser as their creator. He was always a gentleman about it and gave Harry the lion's share of the credit for creating the world that the stories were set in. Oh, that's really nice. Right? That's like the thing you never hear about. That's like, you know, everyone's like, well, Jack Kirby never got any credit for anything. And yet, like, here you are. Fritz Lieber's like, you know, man, he did a lot of work, too. Don't forget my buddy. Yeah, totally. Aw, that makes me happy in my heart. <laughs> so the first story was called Two Sought Adventure, and it appeared in 1939. Uh, and then Lieber proceeded to write a whole ream of stories over the next several decades. They are probably my favorite fantasy stories. It's close with Elric, but there's something a little bit more fun about the Fafrin and the Grey Mouser stories. They are part of an Appendix N, and I think that they're very much an important part of Dungeons & Dragons. You can't read Fafford and Grey Mouser stories without just kind of understanding the idea of a fantasy city comes right from there. And the idea of the Thieves' Guild, the idea of an organization of thieves working in a city, that is pure Fritz Lieber. That comes directly out of the Lankmar books. There's no historical precedent for that, really. I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, and it's a low magic setting, but it's weird. Like, magic is funky. There's a little bit of, like, the cosmic stuff. Lieber was friends with Lovecraft to a degree. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, Lieber really started getting writing at the end of Lovecraft's life, but they did correspond. He wrote a couple Cthulhu Mythos stories in his time. He's uh, quite a bit more liberal. He's probably, out of all of the pulp guys that I like, he's the most liberal. He was a son of a, an actor, so he was Hollywood born and bred. Handsome fella. And yeah, so every once in a while, like the magic has a very otherworldly feel to it. One of the most famous stories is Bazaar of the Bazaar, 
which should immediately be recognizable to anybody who looked at a Dragon magazine in the 1980s because it was a column ongoing for magic items. And that story involves sort of uh, interdimensional junk peddlers who kind of go to a world and sell garbage, basically, that has uh, illusions on it. So you think that you're getting these really great things. Uh, and that's sort of like the way they invade the world is through, you know, capitalism. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> so it's like going to like the world's like best, worst swap meet. It's like, here, look at this wonderful tchotchke that you think is a really high end magical items, but it's really crap. Yeah, exactly. Love it. And Mouser gets caught up in that. They have girls in cages, like big, I guess, canary cages. And to him, they look like, you know, pretty dancing girls. And he's just like, oh, yes, this is fun. They both have these sorceress <laughs> step parents, sort of. Shilva of the eyeless face and Nagalbal of the seven eyes, who kind of look out for them. And they recognize the threat of this invasion. They give Fafherd this gauze that he can put over his eyes so he could see through the illusions. And all the dancing oh, that's cool. girls. Yeah. All the dancing girls are actually giant spiders in the cages. So like <laughs> Gravehouser's up like trying to climb into the cage and Fafford's trying to pull him out because there's a giant spider in there that's gonna eat him. Well, talk about looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> And there's a really great sense of humor throughout the Fafford and Grey Bowser stories, which I really love. I feel like fantasy has a tendency to get very serious, especially in the modern era with like, you know, Game of Thrones and all these like really thick, heavy fantasy novel books that are like seven books long. It's like 10,000 words of world building and everything's always very serious. It's always the end of the world. You know, people are dying. Hambone, people are dying. We can't have fun. I know. I know. And... In those books, you're kind of just like, man, get to the action already, because yeah. I want to know what's going on, but I also want to know what's happening. Yeah. And Elric is like that. Elric is super serious, almost to the point of being farcical. But it, I love the fact that Lankmar has humor in it, and that balances the tragedy that goes on in the books. My favorite story is one that was written in 1970. It's called Ilmet and Lankmar. And chronologically, it's one of the early stories. It's actually the story of how Fafford and Grey Mouser met. Aw, buddy origin story. Yeah, so it involves the Thieves Guild in Lankmar, and they run afoul of it, and their lady friends get eaten by rats. Oh, no. Yeah, the Thieves Guild has a pet necromancer. So when they cross the guild, the necromancer sends rats out to have their vengeance, and then they basically go, uh, how do I say it without... They go ape shit, and they, they raid the Thieves Guild and kill a whole bunch of people. Even though it was a later story, I read it sort of chronologically. So it really set the stakes because they're these two lighthearted goofballs. But when things go bad, they are men of action. And then, you know, it all spirals from there because like they're just so horrified and despondent over the loss of their loves that they leave Lankmar and they journey the world and try and find themselves. And that forms the whole arc is them just trying to like live their lives. The last few stories are of them sort of retiring on an island. It's great stuff. <laughs> Because they get old and crotchety. Yeah, that's the kind of adventure stuff that I love, man. Like, I love the idea of the screwball adventurer who just kind of happens into the action, but is heroic enough in their heart that they're always going to step up and do the right thing. Like, to me, that's the more, like, heroic characters that aren't just like, I was born to to go and save people, and I was born to, like, you know, live this life as a hero. It's like, well, I kind of just showed up today looking to maybe have a sandwich and get laid, but if I have to slay these spider people to save everyone for the greater good, then I guess can I get my sandwich to go? Like, <laughs> that is the kind of adventure that I love, and I love the idea, and you never really hear about the adventurers who go, all right, I've done this long enough. I've I've cheated death as long as I possibly can. Maybe I'll just go retire somewhere and do some day drinking and finally eat that sandwich while it's hot. And, you know, we'll just do some chores maybe. Like, I like that. Like, I will come out of retirement if I have to. If I have to get off this bar stool, and pick up my sword again, I'm going to do it begrudgingly. And, like, I'm into that idea of, like, grumpy old men, the retired adventuring party. Yeah. So Fafford and the Grey Mouse are totally working class heroes. You know, they have their ups and downs. There's no overarching storyline. There's no great threat that they thwart. There's no war. Like there's episodes of adventure, but like sometimes, you know, a story will start and they're rich and sometimes the next story, they're poor, you know, and they eventually retire and they retire and it's just like, well, we're done with this. And there's no real lesson in their whole lives. They lived a life and the last stories are sort of them reckoning with it. 
I find it extremely interesting and refreshing. And you're right. Nobody really delves into that that much. Like you always get caught up in like the idea of the epic. And there's nothing epic about Fafford and the Grey Mouser. And I love that. Yeah, there's certainly nothing epic about retirement. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I'm never going to retire, so I won't know. <laughs> Me neither, probably. When you work for yourself, you work till you die. That's the story of every adventurer. I mean, Fafford and the Grey Mouse, they don't actually retire. They come out of retirement, of course, because there's always one last job. Always. Anyway, so that's, in a nutshell, the Fafford and the Grey Mouse stories. They're fantastic. You should read them. So let's move on to the explicit connection that they have, besides inspiring role-playing games. They provide a campaign setting for Dungeons & Dragons. Let me guess. Let me guess. It's called Lankmar. It is. Lankmar. City of Adventure. Yes! I'm so smart. So... It came out in 1985 for first edition and was re-released for second edition in 1993. Of the two versions, you should really buy both, to be honest, if you're into this stuff. The first one has better art and also like a handy little booklet, which I'll get to in a second. The second one is a little bit clearer, has a little bit more information, has a lot more layouts, floor plans, stuff like that. I have both, and it's one of the ones where I'm just like, I'm happy that I have both, instead of like, ugh, God, I have both. You know, where am I going to find all this <laughs> shelf space, you know? So, first things first, it is not straight D&D. You can't just, you know, roll up regular characters and bring them into Lankmar. It is a modified system of Dungeons & Dragons, because the magic is so different. Really? Yeah, and they modified the magic system to kind of account for that. There are no priests. It's either thief, fighter, and wizard. But Wizard is really reserved for NPCs. It isn't something that you should really play in Lankmar because it's a very gritty, very street level kind of adventuring feel that you're going for with Lankmar. And magic would seriously unbalance it because like magic solves problems and creates problems on a scale in Lankmar that your characters aren't really equipped to handle. So it should always be an outside factor. And they do a pretty good job of it. I usually complain about how inflexible the... D&D system is in adapting it to other settings and like it doesn't work at all for the Conan D&D modules because they do a similar thing with that to kind of make it more like in the spirit of the Robert Howard stories but that doesn't work because your characters are too powerful whereas it does work in Lankmar and that's sort of an interesting contrast but the real thing that is so beautiful about City of Adventure is the fact that it is a city book it is probably for the time it's like one of the top three city source books for a fantasy role-playing game and honestly like not a whole lot of stuff has happened since then you got night city for cyberpunk but like this really nails cities for use with dungeons and dragons certainly and it's frustrating because they nail it so well and then tsr kind of forgets it and the thing that's really really cool about this is like you get this beautiful map, right? And it shows all of Lankmar and it's a really nice TSR style map and the street names are all laid out, but there's all these weird gray squares and those gray squares are always in the middle of city blocks. These are the side streets and alleys and inside the source book are all of these square geomorphs that you can lay in to the map whenever your characters go off the beaten path. So A, your Lankmar is always going to be different than everybody else's Lankmar. And B, your Lankmar can always be different. They could go down the same set of like back streets every time it could be a different geomorph, you know? Wow, okay, so that's awesome. Yeah, because this place is a crazy tangle of streets and alleys and rookeries and sewers and all this stuff, plazas and things that are built on top of each other. So like, you could repeatedly adventure the same city block over and over and over again and always find something new. And because the city is always changing, you know, there's constantly construction, things are burning down. It feels like a city because of that. And there's a whole bunch of stuff to like make the city come alive with, you know, random encounters and color and stuff. So all of this conspires to make like an excellent city source book for the players to explore. But at the same time, it's really easy to manage as the DM because like you only have a couple dozen options and geomorphs by their nature are modular. So you're dropping them in. But then on top of that, you have all these building floor plans that you can sort of drop into the geomorph. So it's all this modular detail that you can kind of zoom in and zoom out as you need to on the fly because it doesn't matter. Like your players aren't going to remember what's going on down on Fish Street, you know, that that bar was there, unless that bar becomes super important. 
if you know you're just there that one game you know like who cares you don't need to put it on the map but it makes it feel like the city is alive and oh yeah that bar that one time but like i don't remember where it is <laughs> you know yeah, man. I mean, players are barely going to remember more than four swords that they have in their inventory, so I <laughs> doubt they would remember the bar in Fishtown. Yeah, and it's so good. It's ridiculously good, and it gets even better. So Lankmar had its introduction into Dungeons & Dragons in 1980. It was in the Deities and Demigods book. They had the, you know, Fafford, Grey Mouser in there, along with the Cthulhu monsters and the Elric stuff. Interesting thing. In the 70s, Fritz was a little bit on the skids. His wife had passed away, and it really kind of messed him up, and he might have been an alcoholic. Oh, no. Yeah, he was definitely living in something approaching poverty. Whether or not like this was a choice of his is a matter of debate. From what I understand of the situation, he was living in a crappy apartment in San Francisco, and it was filled with books. And actually, you could read a novel called Our Lady of Darkness, which is basically semi-autobiographical. So like, like the main character in that is an old drunk. His wife died, and he has an apartment that's kind of crappy but full of books. He builds sort of like a human-sized pile of books in his double bed so that he has something to sleep next to. That is incredibly sad. <laughs> It's sad, but it's not sad. You have to read the book. It's a fantastic horror novel. But Fritz's life sort of parallels that to some degree. People are not sure of to what extent. So it turns out that Chaosium had the rights to make a Lankmar RPG. And this is part of the whole thing with Deities and Demigods, is that Elric and the Lovecraft stuff were also uh, licensed to Chaosium. However, because Greg Stafford loved Fritz Lieber's work so much and was horrified that whether or not Fritz was doing it because he didn't care or, you know, whatever, he was perfectly happy maybe, but Stafford was horrified that he was living in, in this way. So he didn't make a stink about the fact that Lieber had also sold the rights to D&D. So he released it to TSR so that they could make their Lankmar game and never made an issue about the money. And because he did that, the Lankmar line, it's not a huge line for D&D. It's probably one of their best campaign settings, but it's not a huge amount of books, maybe 10 books. But the royalties from those books, it was always a sought after line, a fairly popular line. And the royalties for those books basically gave Fritz Lieber financial security for the rest of his life. I believe he died in 1993. So, you know, 20 years, that ain't bad. Man. Right? It's like heartwarming. My God, I'm like, I'm like, my eyes are welling up, and I'm like, that was so like uncharacteristically kind of anybody in the publishing business. Like, can Greg Stafford get any better? Every time I hear stories about Greg Stafford, my eyes well up because he just seems like the nicest, most effortlessly caring person in the role playing industry. I can't, I can't even, as the kids say. Yeah, we've got feelings, folks. We've got <laughs> feelings over this. So yeah, and that's Lankmar in a nutshell. Well, Stu, do you have any final thoughts on Lankmar? And please don't make me cry anymore. <laughs> My final thoughts are, if you have not read the original Fritz Lieber stories, you should definitely try and check them out. If you can't get the prose stories, I highly recommend the comic book adaptations by Mike Mignola and Howard Chaikin. They were probably my first pathway into it, and my view of fantasy cities has never been the same after seeing Mike Mignola's take on them. And if you have read those things, but haven't checked out the Lankmar City book, the adventures, the source books, everything else in the Lankmar line is secondary to the city books. They're good. They're fine. But the City of Adventure is the real crown jewel of the line. It is just about as perfect a city book as you'll find. Certainly for 1985, it was top of the line, and you should read it if you like city adventures. Very cool. Well, this was another amazing and shockingly emotional episode of the Vintage RPG Podcast. <laughs> to work, the people find you. They can find me on Instagram at Vintage RPG, where I'm posting stuff about old pulp fiction and fantasy role-playing games every single day. Very cool. You can find me on the Twitter at Handbreaker. I tweet about board games. I tweet about cute animals. I tweet about Dungeons and Dragons. You could also find my day-to-day -day adventures in podcasting and in life over on Instagram at John Hambone McGuire. If you like the Vintage RPG podcast, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Your reviews really do help other listeners to find us. If you like, like the Vintage RPG podcast and maybe like want to go to an ice cream social with us, think about joining our Patreon, patreon.com slash vintage RPG. We got a lot of extra stuff there, including videos, essays, RPGs that are in production as we speak. Very cool stuff. 
So thanks again for checking us out. For Stu Horvath, I'm John Hambone McGuire. May the dice always roll in your favor. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Every review helps other listeners to find us. The Vintage RPG Podcast is a ham-fisted production. Music by Dega West. Art by Schaefer Brown. If you like the podcast, you should also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com 